audiology. Audiology is the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of hearing loss and certain vestibular disorders. So audiology is a two-pronged discipline. Audiologists work with people with hearing loss and also people who may have a balance disorder. If you see an ear, nose, and throat doctor and meet with an audiologist in his or her office, those audiologists often work with people with balance disorders to see if their inner ear is a contributing factor to their balance disorder. At the healthcare center, I focus in on just hearing, which is going to be the main topic today. What is an audiologist? An audiologist is a state licensed healthcare professional who either holds a master's degree or a clinical doctorate degree in audiology. So audiology, like many other allied health fields, such as physical therapy, um, pharmacy, the field is going from a master's level to a doctorate level. So not a physician, but a doctor of audiology. So in short, an audiologist is an expert in the field of hearing healthcare. So who are we? Again, my name's Hillary, and I've been at Masonic Care's Hearing Center since 2002. So it'll be 14 years this October. I always say as long as they'll have me, I'll stay. It's a very great place to work. I did my bachelor's and master's degree from UConn. Go Huskies. And I finished my doctorate degree from Salus University in 2009. The Hearing Center. Um, many people who may be familiar with the Masonic Care campus know how sprawling it can be. I feel fortunate that the Hearing Center is located inside one of the two entrances at the healthcare center down the hill. So there's the main entrance, but there's also the Sturges entrance. And my office is located right inside the door. We have ample parking, um, so you don't have to go throughout the entire building to find us. We're very easily accessible. And of course, I always like to stress that we're open to all. You don't have to be part of the Masonic Care Continuum to use the Hearing Center. We have many people from the community who just come to the Masonic Care Healthcare Center for hearing services. So anyone is welcome. So our topics today, one, I like to review the warning signs of hearing loss. I like to review the hearing test and hearing aid evaluation process. And I always like to end on some effective communication strategies we can all employ to make life a little easier. A few statistics, 38 million Americans have a hearing loss. Huge number of people, four times the population of New York City. That boils down to approximately one in six Americans, regardless of their age, has a hearing loss. Roughly one in four households in the United States has a person who has a hearing loss. It's cited as the third most common health-related problem that people face. So it's very ubiquitous. Our best hearing is at age 18. Wow. You know, it's usually a pretty staggering fact. Uh, so just by living our lives, um, the auditory system is, um, the auditory system can be affected by the aging process. Um, if we have any sort of noise exposure, whether it's occupational noise exposure, recreational noise exposure, that can have a toll on our hearing. Certain um, health concerns can also have an effect on our hearing. It's just like any other um, system in our body. So, it's something we want to address because it's a very common issue. If I think about my preventative health care, I know I get my vision tested once a year. I can't order new contacts unless I get my vision tested. I get my teeth cleaned twice a year. And while I'm leaving one appointment at the dentist, they're already signing me up for one six months out. I have a physical every July. But people usually don't think about putting hearing on that checklist. So here we have this problem, hearing loss. That's the third most common health-related problem. And usually people don't add that to their preventative health list. So I would encourage people, as long as the whole audiology community is, to get their hearing screened. Screenings are a quick, simple way to see if you need any further hearing test. Screenings are pass-fail. We test both ears to see if you can hear at a normal level. If you pass, wonderful. If you don't, then we know you need a more comprehensive test. It's something that you should do periodically, maybe every 18 to two years. 
Of course, if you notice a shift in your hearing, we want to see you sooner, but it's something to add to that preventative health care list. At the health care center, we offer free hearing screenings, which is usually lovely. They're 15 minutes, um, so no time commitment, and it's a simple pass-fail. So if you're thinking about needing a hearing screening, it's a very nice way to start. Thank you. What if you've already noticed a change in your hearing? So it's not that you just need a screening to determine, make sure that everything's normal, but what if you're experiencing some sort of shift? There are warning signs to hearing loss. Everything on this slide tends to be the more obvious one. If you had a decline in your hearing, pretty obvious. Could be in one ear, could be in two ears. If you've had a sudden shift in your hearing, meaning the shift has happened over the course of a few weeks, a few days, even overnight, that's usually something that people would immediately get some um, medical assistance. Hearing losses can be stable, meaning they've been kind of shifting this way for a while, or hearing losses can fluctuate, meaning one day might be better than the next. Of course, if you have any pain or drainage from your ear, <coughs> that's usually a sign to get your hearing checked out because you want to make sure that there's nothing that needs any medical attention. And of course, tinnitus or tinnitus, however you choose to pronounce it. Tinnitus or tinnitus is an umbrella term for any sort of head noise. It can happen in one ear or both ears. It can be frequent, occasional, or constant. Tinnitus can be something that accompanies a hearing loss, and it may not be any sign of um, reason for concern. However, if your tinnitus is in one ear more than the other, if it's accompanied by dizziness or pain, that's usually a reason to get your hearing checked. So those are obvious. The second thing I highlight are the less obvious ones, communication difficulties. These tend to be much sneakier. So if I pull up an audiogram, this is the crux of what we work off of, an audiogram. The numbers along the bottom represent different pitches, also known as frequencies. 250, 500, really low, booming pitches. 4,000, 8,000, really high, sharp, shrill. So just like keys on a piano, it goes from low to high. This side of the graph, the y-axis, represents decibels, a term, a measurement of volume. Zero to 20 would be incredibly soft. 100, 120, incredibly loud. So what we want to do is to see which sound you can hear and at which level. Now ideally, I'm doing this with my left hand, there we go. We would want to hear 100% of those pitches at zero decibels 100% of the time. But when we lose our hearing, it's not all or nothing. Where most adults first notice a shift in their hearing is in that high pitched, high frequency area. So for the low booming pitches, it's within normal limits, and as that pitch increases, those high pitches become harder to hear. Now if we look at it in terms of speech, what does that mean? The parts of speech that fall in that low pitched, low frequency area are the vowel sounds. Vowel sounds give speech energy, give it volume, because we're able to hear because of the vowel sounds. In the high-pitched area, those are where the consonant sounds are. Consonants are critically crucial for making speech sound clear. So for uh, most adults, when they see a shift in that high-frequency area, they often say, I can hear you. I can't understand you all the time. So people who predominantly have that high-pitched hearing loss often tell me this. Everyone is mumbling. Things don't sound clear. My uncle says this, my Uncle Bob. He said, you're all mumbling. And we had to say to him, Uncle Bob, the whole world didn't start mumbling at the exact same moment. It might be your hearing. I can hear you, just not understand you. So most of that parts of speech is coming through, just not 100% of it. You may need repetition. Because you're not hearing all those crucial parts of speech, you're constantly trying to fill in the blanks going by visual cues, uh, contextual cues, so if you're not able to hear it that first time around, you ask for repetition. You might
might be misunderstanding words because of those differences of the consonant sounds. If you're not able to hear them, it can, you might be mistaking one word for another. This happened uh, last Thanksgiving with my uncle again. Um, we were at the Thanksgiving table. It was the end of the day. There were about four or five of us on one side. And my cousin Gary says how he found an internet radio station he loves. He says it's all comedy, comedy bits. It's great. My uncle, who has the hearing loss, says, why are you listening to communist radio stations? <laughs> so you can see the difference. Comedy communist totally changed the meaning. So he was misunderstanding one word for another. My uncle Bob has a great sense of humor, so he laughed it up. Family and friends may complain that the television is too loud. This is always a great objective gauge. People say, you know, I used to have the TV at about a 30, now I'm cranking it up to a 45, and my spouse doesn't really care for that. You might have difficulty on the phone. When you think about the phone, it's solely based on auditory information. You can't see the person, so you're going solely by your hearing. And because of that, that might be one of the first places that you notice some difficulty. You might have difficulty in noisy environments. Makes sense. One-on-one -on -one in a quiet room might be a slam dunk. No problem whatsoever. But you get into a restaurant where there may be some background noise, if you're grocery shopping and you have a lot of ambient noise around you, it can be even harder to make out what's being said. People say to me all the time, I read lips. And we all do that to a certain degree. We get a ton of visual information when we can, or cues of speech when we can see the person. So you find that you have to face the person in order to understand what they're saying. And many people often say they're exhausted by the end of the day. You use so much effort to try to figure out what's being said that it can be fatiguing. So much so that people might refrain from doing some of the things they love to do because it's exhausting. They have so much effort to hear. So far, so good? <clears throat> so what do you do next? If you or your loved one identify with any of those warning signs, rather than doing a screening, I'd recommend a more complete test. The goal of the hearing test is to make sure that you don't need any medical intervention, that you don't need to see the physician to see if it's something that can be treated. So case in point was, I had a gentleman one time who said to me, Hillary, I need a hearing aid, I can't hear in my left ear. It's okay. Came down, we did a hearing test. We found that he had some fluid behind his eardrum. Very common in kids. We see that in kids all the time. But not quite as common in adults. So since we noticed that, we referred him back to his physician, found that he had an ear infection, he was treated for that, and his hearing went back to baseline. Now is that the norm? No. But that's what we want to make sure that we don't need. Medicare requires a physician's referral prior to testing, which um, we can always facilitate for them. And at the hearing center, we accept most major insurances for the hearing test. And I know you're all eating, but I always have to do a little slide on wax. It's normal to have wax. Um, it serves a purpose. Some people never have a wax problem. Some people might have to see the physician three or four times a year to get their ears flushed out. Most hearing losses are not caused by wax but it can interfere with how we conduct the test. With a hearing test, we want best case scenario. So we look in there, make sure you don't have any extra wax. If you do, either I can take it out or sometimes we refer to the physician. Once you get the wax out, then we can do the hearing test. That way we get really good valid results. With the hearing test, we're doing two things. We want to see the softest level you can hear, demonstrated by the audiogram a few moments ago. But we also want to see how well can you understand speech in different circumstances. Quiet would be best case scenario, but we also do a little bit of testing in noise in the sound booth to see how you do under those more challenging situations. Again, to very, the goal is to make sure that everything is medically sound. And we always write up the evaluation and a report to send to the referring physician. Okay. So when we think about how we hear, we think about our ear. When we actually don't hear with our ear, we hear with our brains. Our ear picks up the sound, but our brain does all the processing. Our brain remarkably does four things all the time. Our brain needs to tell us where sound is coming from. So is it somebody calling my name from the front or from behind me? Is it an alarm coming from my right or the left? Is it um, 
a dog barking from the right side or the left side, we need to tell where that sound is originating from. Then we need to be able to recognize what that sound is. Is it speech, music, noise, an alarm, that dog barking? With all that auditory information coming at you from all different directions, potentially, our brain's able to focus in on what we want to hear. If I'm at a noisy restaurant and the waiter comes over, my brain allows me to focus in on what that waiter's saying and not allow the background noise to overcome it. Then, as I'm talking to that waiter, my brain needs to separate out all those parts of speech so that I can understand what's being said. All of that happens very quickly and miraculously. However, when your ear is, has a hearing loss, and your, it doesn't allow your brain to get all that important information. So what happens is, your brain has to work even harder to figure out what's being said. It takes much more effort, and you're not able to hear those fine details of speech. One area of research that's really coming to light is how a hearing loss can affect our cognition. Because our brain is using a ton of resources to figure out what's being said, a lot of research is going into how can that affect our cognition over time. And one area is they're, they're looking into does treating a hearing loss by getting something like hearing aids, can that have an effect on our cognition over time? So you may see in the marketing materials that you about hearing that may come to you a lot about brain hearing and how well or how a hearing loss can affect your cognition. It's important to determine that if you get any of that information, that it's information that's based in research. And if you have any questions about something that's being sent to you, an audiologist like myself can help you navigate that. Sorry about that. Okay. One person, uh, Frank Lynn, based out of Johns Hopkins, is doing a lot of studies on hearing loss and cognition. He's an otolaryngologist, so an ENT, and he is an epidemiologist, so he researches how things come about. So he's looking at whether or not hearing loss can have an effect on their cognition. And one thing they've determined that if you do have a hearing loss, it does put you at a greater risk, potentially for dementia. Um, it's not a cause, it's just an increased risk factor. It's like if you had a um, poor diet and a lack of exercise, that puts you at a greater risk for heart disease. <coughs> So now they're trying to determine if hearing loss is a contributing factor to changes in our cognition. One thing that we definitively know is that untreated hearing loss can have a negative, negative effect on our quality of life. Many studies have shown that people who have a hearing loss and opt not to treat it, meaning get hearing aids, often report an increase in sadness, depression, anxiety, paranoia, and poor social relationships. I have a woman, she lives in our independent living. She was very active. She used to go to the cocktail parties that they had throughout the week, every single lecture or music event she went to. She was a social butterfly. When her hearing started to change, she felt less confident going into those social situations because she wasn't able to understand what was going on. She started relying on her husband to help her fill in the blanks. So someone would say something, everyone would laugh, but because of her hearing, she missed that punchline. So she started refraining from a lot of those activities that she loved to do, and it was solely based on her hearing. Anxiety, I mean, I can absolutely understand this. I had a woman who lived at home, um, she lived by herself, and she had hearing loss. This was before she got hearing aids. She would crank the television up to a level that she was able to hear. Well, when someone knocked on the door or if the phone rang, she wasn't able to hear that. So one time her adult grandson was calling and she wasn't picking up. He ran over to the house, knocking on the door. She wasn't answering. Luckily, he had a key. He opened the door and there she was watching TV. But you can imagine how startling that was for her that all of a sudden there's a person standing in her home. So I can understand how not knowing what's going on in your environment can make people feel anxious. Poor social relationships, I see this often. I refer back to my Uncle Bob. His um, grandchildren, when they were in college, they'd call periodically and they wanted to tell him everything that they've been doing. But because he couldn't hear on the phone, he ended up just passing it over to my Aunt Patty. So that affected the relationship he had with his grandchildren. He wasn't able to really hear and listen what was going on in this very important time in their life. I like this quote. 
Blindness separates people from things. Deafness separates people from people. Our hearing allows us to connect on many different levels. So, the good thing is, there's good news. So we know that hearing loss is common. We know hearing loss that's not treated, um, meaning getting hearing aids or some sort of amplification, we know that that can negatively impact our quality of life. But the good thing is, is that the majority of people can benefit from hearing aids. Upwards of 90 to 95% of people who have a hearing loss can get help. Appreciable, significant help. I look at it like if you had an ailment and your physician said to you, I have a treatment that's going to work 99, 90 to 95% of the time, that's incredibly encouraging. So if people say to me, I tried hearing aids and they don't work, that for me begs more questions. I want to know what they've tried, what they've done, what made them feel that way, because usually there's a solution. The National Council on Aging showed that 71% of people who wear hearing aids report an improvement in life overall. That's huge. 74% of hearing aid wearers report an improvement in relationships at home. If you're able to hear and understand the conversation, if you don't have to ask for repetition, it's incredibly less frustrating for both the listener and the speaker. 67% of hearing aid wearers report an improvement in self-esteem. If you can go into those social situations, hear the punchline, respond appropriately, throw your ten, two cents in confidently, that can be a huge improvement to your confidence. How do hearing aids assist? What they do is they don't restore your hearing back to normal, but what it allows you to do is get more of that crucial information, those fine details of speech, so that you can understand it. Hearing aids work together. They help you tell where sounds are coming from. So the reason why I know that um, if someone says my name on the left-hand side, the reason why I know they're on the left-hand side, because that sound hits my left ear before it hits my right ear. My brain uses those cues to tell where sound's coming from. It's important to remember that your hearing is as unique as your fingerprint. And when it comes to talking about hearing aids, it's prescriptive. It's not a one-size-fits-all approach. So what may work well for you may be the polar opposite of what I would recommend for your neighbor. And there are a lot of factors that factor in. With a hearing aid evaluation, meaning if someone wants to talk about hearing aids, we usually schedule 45 minutes. I want to know as much about that individual's listening concerns, listening needs. You know, we got a little strobe light going on. <laughs> as, much as, um, as much information that's unique to that person, because that's going to factor into my recommendation. I love it when family members come, whether it be a spouse, a child, a parent. Um, I had one woman this past six months ago, she came with her sister, her niece, both nieces, and one of the niece's, niece's husband. It was perfect. We got everybody on board. Everybody knew um, the whole process. We got to find out their family dynamics. And it really aided me on what recommendations I gave. And now we're able to give demonstrations in the office. So I, before, we didn't have that flexibility, meaning like 10 years ago. But now we have. Um, demonstration hearing aids for the person to listen to while they're in the office. I don't know about you, but if I was to buy a car, I would want to take that car for a test drive. So now with hearing aids, you have the ability to listen before you purchase. A couple of the hearing aid considerations would be, first, the degree of hearing loss. Does the person have a mild hearing loss or a profound hearing loss? You want something that's cosmetically appealing. I have a couple samples up here. Um, with the technology improving like it is, even people with severe to profound hearing losses are able to get something that's pretty inconspicuous most of the time. I feel like you have to be happy with the way it looks or that hearing aid's just gonna sit in the drawer, which is the last thing you want. Listening needs. Are you somebody who's kind of a homebody in quiet situations? Or are you somebody who's really that busybody going from one diverse, noisy environment to another? Case in point was I had a gentleman, it was him and his wife who lived at home. Their two favorite things to do were read and cook. So pretty quiet activities. Um, so they had very different needs than say another person that I have who is a teacher. So she is going to meetings, she's in the classroom, she's in a cafeteria, she's outside. 
Um, she's on the phone with parents. <coughs> very different listening needs. So you want something that's going to meet that. Finances. For most hearing aid purchasers, it is a private pay um, service. So most insurances don't cover the cost of hearing aids. Medicare definitely does not. Most secondary insurances go up Medicare guidelines, but I always say it's worth the phone call. We have had people call their secondary insurances and they've gotten some coverage. Um, but yes, yeah, so you want to be able to get the best hearing aid you can get for your listening needs in a price range that's comfortable for you. Manual dexterity. So if you're somebody who maybe has a loss of feeling in their fingers, maybe you have some arthritis, you need to be able to independently put that hearing aid in and confidently. So that factors in. If you have a vision impairment, you know, you need to be able to identify the right from the left. You need to be able to change the battery. So that can factor in as well. Hearing aid technology has been growing leaps and bounds. I know the cell phone that I got three years ago, they don't even sell anymore. Hearing aids are kind of exactly like that. So what was top of the line 10 years ago may now be obsolete. So people who say to me, I tried a hearing aid 10 years ago, it didn't work for me. Apples and oranges, They're, the technology is improving such that again, we usually can find a solution. And not all hearing aids are the same. A couple things that go into it, directional microphones, meaning there's a microphone in the front, there's a microphone in the back. The hearing aids are constantly deciding if you're in a noisy place versus a quiet place to put the emphasis on what's in front of you. Noise reduction, being able to tell if that sound of the air conditioning is constant and minimize that. Speech enhancement, the hearing aids constantly sampling the incoming sound to determine is it speech or not speech. And the hearing aid's always going to put the emphasis on that speech sound. <coughs> These are just a couple of the things that might be available. And it's my job during that hearing aid evaluation process to show you what might be beneficial for you. Hearing aids are becoming more and more connected to the devices that we use every day. So whether it be a television, a cell phone, our phone, our cell phone, um, or computer, our hearing aid needs to be connected to it. So I have a couple samples up here. We have, most of the major hearing aid companies have a version of this, a streamer. If a person will wear it around their neck and sound will transmit from the streamer to their, to their hearing aids. So if they have a cell phone, it's going to simply hit a button, that sound's going to go to both hearing aids. It can connect to your television. So I know with my parents, my dad tends to crank the television up more than their mom, my mom. So we have him using this, where it transmits the sound of the TV to the streamer to both hearing aids. So that way they can independently adjust the volume to a level they both can agree on. Save the marriage, I think. So, um, so there are a lot of assistive listening devices, things beyond hearing aids that can connect to the devices we use all the time. When someone gets a hearing aid, I usually see people three or four times in that first month. It's par for the course to have to expect some adjustments. I had a gentleman one time who said to me, Hillary, I haven't heard the clock tick in two years. This is great. I love it. Two or three weeks later, I had another gentleman, similar hearing loss, similar hearing aid, say to me, why do I have to hear sounds like the clock ticking? So that for me really demonstrated how some people may welcome sounds, others we might need to do a little counseling on what to expect. It's important to remember that most hearing losses didn't happen overnight. From the time a person first notices a hearing loss to when they actually pull the trigger to get their hearing tested is on average of seven years. So seven years is a long time to get used to these subpar levels. So when they first get the hearing aids, it may be a little overwhelming at first. And it's my job to help people navigate that. The other thing with hearing aids fittings is we want to ensure benefit. Yes, of course we want the person to be subjectively pleased and they feel that they're getting an improvement in their functional communication, but we need to prove it. So with working with an audiologist, we do a, some objective outcome measures. We want to make sure sound is audible and that you're getting benefit in both quiet and noisy situations. So we do things such as visual speech mapping. Um, it's just one of the battery of tests that we like to use to make sure the hearing aid is doing its job. It's important to remember that 
It takes skill, expertise, and guidance from an audiologist to make sure that you're getting that substantial success. It's the law when somebody gets a hearing aid that they have a right of return of at least 30 days. So I work with several different manufacturers, which makes me have a more diverse product line. I'm not married to one particular hearing aid company. I have my favorites, and it ebbs and flows depending on when certain things come out. But you want to make sure that if you're not happy with that first choice, that you have the option of trying a different make or a different model. And if you find, and it happens every once in a while, that it's not something you want to pursue at that particular moment, you do have that right of return. After that 30 days, if someone feels like things are going well and they're good to go, I usually see people every three to six months after. Reason why, we want to make sure the hearing aid's functioning, that it's clean. Maybe the person's listening needs change, we have to do a little adjustment. We get a hearing aid knowing your hearing may change over time. So you want a hearing aid for a good five years. So in the course of that five years, you might have a shift in your hearing. So if you do, barring any sort of monumental shift, we usually can use the existing hearing aid, adjust it to accommodate that change in hearing. If someone has a problem with their hearing aids, it's usually something we can resolve in the office. Um, whether it needs cleaning, maybe a minor repair, an adjustment. It's important to remember that for most hearing aid, um, audiologists who dispense hearing aids, when you purchase the hearing aid, you purchase the service. So I can see someone two times or 200 times. You're not billed for that individual appointment. You may incur a cost if it's out of warranty and it needs a, a, a repair, um, but anything like reprogramming, counseling, adjustments, it's all included. Um, I have people say to me, I, I have been wearing my hearing aid, I didn't want to bother you. I'm like, you can bother me, you know, as much as you need to. We're gonna conquer this together. Effective long-term hearing aid treatment, it's a process. It's not an event. So it's not like me when I go to the store, I purchase my cell phone, I obtain the cell phone, and I'm done. That's a transaction. Hearing aids, look at it like a rehabilitation process. If you had a knee injury, you wouldn't go to physical therapy just one time. you go over the course of a few weeks to really regain that function. Hearing is very much the same path. Click down to my graph again. I mentioned earth earlier that hearing aids don't restore your hearing back to normal. Sorry about that. I love this graph. This is my favorite graph. Um, it's important that hearing aids don't restore your hearing back to normal but it's also incredibly important to be mindful of what a realistic expectation is depending on where you are. So if we look at this graph, we have different environments. One speaker, television, small group conversation, supposed to be quiet environments. But then environments can become more challenging. Restaurant, outdoors, a cocktail party, a wedding reception. Wedding receptions are the most challenging situation. Ideally, we want to hear 100% of what was being said 100% of the time. So if we look at the line all the way to the right, that represents someone, how they would do if they had normal hearing in those situations. If you have normal hearing, one-on-one, -on -one, slam dunk. But even if your hearing is normal, if you are in a place that's particularly challenging, you're not going to hear 100% of what's being said just due to the environment. I went to a wedding uh, last Memorial Day. And we were at a table of 10. It was during the dinner hour, so there was a little music, nothing crazy. And we were kind of in a quieter part of the room. My dad, who has hearing aids, was two over from me. At one point in the, during the dinner, he says, Hillary, I can't hear the people across the table. I said, Dad, neither can I. I never talk to the people across the table because of the distance, the noise, it was impossible. So that to me really illustrated, okay, if you're in a room with 100 people, it's gonna sound like a room with 100 people. If we look at the middle line, the pink one, that represents how people who have a hearing loss, most people who have a hearing loss, how they would perform in those situations if they were using two hearing aids. So you can see it's not quite as good as the normal, but it's close, it's close. 
So while people, hearing aids don't restore our hearing back to normal, the benefit is huge. The blue one, the line all the way to the left, that represents somebody who has a hearing loss in both ears, but they're opting to use just one hearing aid. Now whether that be by choice or by the reality of it, maybe they have a dead ear and a hearing aid wouldn't help, but that shows that if you're only using one ear in a quiet place, you'll do fine, but in a noisy place, you have some substantial difficulty. So far, so good? It's important, and this is a huge part of my job, is to explain to people what to expect. You'll still have some difficulty in noisy situations, as would anybody, and you may need to modify your environment to give you more optimal hearing. So what I'd like to end with are things that we all can do to improve communication. And there's actually a booklet in your um, handouts that really goes into detail about this. It's something that you might want to share with a spouse or a family member that you're with. It's important to remember that communication is a two-way street. Not all the responsibility falls on the listener. As the speaker, we have to set it up so that anyone can hear better and understand. It's important to remember that even if somebody has the most top of the line hearing aid, it doesn't eliminate the need for good communication skills. So here are my, my top ones. We know that background noise can be detrimental for making or for allowing us to hear speech clearly. So if you have the luxury, reduce the background noise. That could be something as simple as muting the television during a commercial when you want to say something. You don't need that extra noise. It might be that if you are going to a restaurant, you request a place that's quieter, maybe not near the front door, not near the kitchen where there's a lot of traffic. When we ask for um, dinner reservations, I routinely do that for my father, because if we don't have to deal with this extraneous noise, it's easier for him. Sometimes we don't have that luxury. If there's one table available at seven o'clock and it's in the middle of the room, well, that's our reality. Get each other's attention first. So if my father is doing a crossword puzzle in the morning, the entire world could be ending and he will not break his focus on. So I know I have to say, hey, Dad, that gives him a moment to stop what he's doing, look up at me, and focus on what I'm about to say. If I just start talking and his attention is somewhere else, regardless of his hearing, he's not going to be able to hear 100% of what I said. Look at each other. People with hearing loss are constantly trying to fill in the blanks to figure out what's being said. So we get a ton of information if we're able to see each other's faces. Decrease the distance between you, or the speaker and the listener. I routinely hear from uh, patients, they say, no, when my wife's in the other room, she starts talking to me and I can't hear her. So that's my job to explain, well, if you get a little closer, that distance, reducing that distance can make a huge difference. And it's important to remember to speak clearly, not necessarily louder. Because most adults have that loss of clarity, Louder is not going to make it clearer. Slowing down our rate of speech can make it easier for people to understand. I use the example if you're uh, driving in your car and the radio station's a little out of range, get a little static, you can turn the volume up. It's not gonna make it clearer. So for people, I'm constantly saying slow it down a little and that's usually easier for people. It's a hard thing to be mindful of all the time, but if we can increase our awareness for these things, it can make life easier. So yeah, I'm a big fan of when people are self-advocates. So if someone says, you know what, I, I can't understand what you're saying right now because we're near this music, let's go step over to the other side of the room, I'll be able to hear you. Or, can you slow it down a little? I want to make sure I can hear everything you're saying. If you're able to just take those quick seconds to remind that speaker to make it easier, it's a win-win. Another note, in addition to communication strategy, um, <coughs> there are things that we can do beyond hearing aids um, to use on our daily basis. It's important to remember that if you're not wearing your hearing aids, you still need to be able to hear on the phone. You need to be able to hear the alarm going off, um, doorbells. So if you find that you're not able to hear those important alerting systems, that would, there are things that can do beyond hearing aids to adjust for that. 
So here we are talking a lot about loss, hearing loss, things we're missing. But it's important to remember that there are things you can gain when you address a hearing loss. So think about things that you could potentially gain. If you're able to hear better, you can connect to your loved ones. You can share ideas. You can feel more relaxed and confident when you're in social situations. Much more social ease. You find that you might be participating in some things that you didn't do before because you feel more confident with what you can hear. You can be more motivated, more independent. I think independence is a huge one. If you don't have to rely on other people to help hear for you, that can be huge. So again, we talk about hearing loss, but the thing to take away is that there are things we can do to improve your hearing, and it can lead to a lot richer and more fulfilled life. So in summary, things that we accomplished today, hopefully. Um, some of the warning signs of hearing loss, including those communication difficulties. To know more about the point of the hearing test, that is to make sure everything is medically sound. To learn about the hearing aid evaluation process. In short, your hearing is as unique as your fingerprint, and the hearing aids should not be a one-size-fits-all. It's very prescriptive. And I, again, always like to end on those communication strategies for us to be mindful for, because it can make the dialogue between our loved ones so much easier 